In this recording, I'm going to talk about VO2 max. So before we talk about VO2 max, let's do a little bit of review. So here's the formula that you've seen multiple times now. Um, I call it the foodstuff formula, for lack of a better term. And this is basically what's going on with uh, aerobic energy production. Okay, we take some uh, food, whether it be carbohydrate or fat, we take in some oxygen, we produce CO2, we get some metabol uh, we get we produce ATP, we get some metabolic CO2, okay, that's CO2 that comes from the intermediate step in Krebs cycle. We get some water, and another one of the byproducts is heat. Okay. As exercise intensity increases, we do more work. Okay. And as, if, as we do more work, we need more ATP. Okay. And as we um, make and produce more ATP, we also produce more heat, okay, which is measured in calories. So as intensity increases, we produce more heat. Uh, and another way of saying that is that we, um, we burn more calories per minute because we're doing more work. Uh, at the same time, we use more oxygen. So as exercise intensity increases, we also use more oxygen, okay? Because we're sending more hydrogen and electron pairs to electron transport chain, we're using greater amounts of oxygen. VO2 max is your maximal ability for using oxygen. So as exercise intensity increases, yes, you're going to use more oxygen. And as intensity increases, you're going to use more oxygen. But there reaches a point where you reach your VO2 max, which means you've reached a point where you are now using or consuming the greatest amount of oxygen your body's capable of using. And so if the intensity increases beyond that, you're not going to be able to increase your oxygen consumption. So it's the maximal capacity for oxygen use. It's measured per unit time, so it's the amount of oxygen used per minute. It is considered the gold standard or the best way to measure aerobic capacity. Um, other terms that are used interchangeably for aerobic capacity are uh, maximal aerobic power. Our book uses that term. You may her have heard the term cardiorespiratory endurance, cardiorespiratory fitness, aerobic fitness. They all mean the same thing. And VO2 max is the best way of measuring an individual's aerobic capacity. So why do we measure aerobic capacity? Um, it's a very good predictor of endurance performance for the average population. If we took uh, just a random sample of students at CSUN and we measured everybody's VO2 max and then we had them run in a 5K, um, the people with the higher VO2 maxes would perform better in the 5K. They would run it faster. Uh, and so if you're looking at an average population, it's a pretty good predictor. However, when you get to a um, subpopulation, so if you get a population of very trained competitive endurance athletes, uh, their VO2 maxes are all going to be high. So VO2 max is not going to be a very good predictor of performance in athletes like this. Um, and there are other predictors that come into play, which we'll talk about in this chapter. Um, lactate threshold comes into play. Uh, economy of movement comes into play. Uh, we'll talk about those. Other things that come into play, which we won't talk about, are psychological aspects and uh, nutritional aspects. What did the person eat um, before they ran? You know, did they do carb loading, etc.? So these two really are beyond the scope of this class, but we will talk about economy and lactate threshold as predictors of aerobic performance. So let's see what VO2 max looks like on a graph. And again, whenever you get a graph, just stop for a second and look at the axis. So what we have here on the x-axis is we have speed. 
So as we move right on the x-axis, the speed is going faster and faster. So you're increasing intensity and you're doing more work as you move to the right. On the y-axis, we have oxygen uptake. So how much oxygen are we using? And the way the units that we use often are it's milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of an individual's body weight per minute. Okay, so for now just understand it as how much oxygen you're using per minute. So you can see that as intensity increases and we're doing more work and we need more ATP, we are up the uptake of oxygen is increasing, which makes sense. Okay, so we're going to do more work, so we're going to need more ATP, so we're going to use more oxygen. Okay, and so that's what happens as we move to the right. Okay, now the red line is an individual who hasn't trained yet. So what we see is that the individual, as the treadmill got faster, they increased work, increased ATP, need, increased oxygen use, and it continued to increase until they got to about 7 miles per hour. Okay? At 7 miles an hour, they hit a VO2 max. When the treadmill sped up to 8 miles an hour, the VO2 max dropped. Okay, so this here, this point here, would be defined as the individual's VO2 max. It was the highest amount of oxygen that, able, that individual was able to consume per minute. Uh, after that, it's either going to plateau or it's going to drop. We took the same individual and trained them. So it was, if we give a numerical value to this, and you look over here on the y-axis, so the VO2 max before training was 30. After training, we did some endurance training, probably did it for a few months, went back and did the same thing again. Here what we found is that at 7 miles per hour, they were able to continue to increase. So when they got to 8 miles an hour before, whereas oxygen consumption plateaued or decreased because this individual wasn't capable of using more oxygen than that. And then after training, you can see that they were able to use more oxygen and they were able to actually continue to increase. They reached a VO2 max of about 60 and therefore they were able to get up to about 11 miles per hour. Okay. So they're able to do a lot more work, produce a lot more ATP, use a lot more oxygen. Okay, and they were able to do this work aerobically. And that's key because the aerobic system is fatigue resistant. So you may be able to run 11 miles an hour but before training, but you would have to do this using primarily the anaerobic system. So you wouldn't be able to maintain this very long. But if you can do 11 miles an hour using the aerobic system, you're going to be able to maintain that level of intensity for a longer period of time than if you were just relying on the anaerobic system. So this is VO2 max. So as uh, many of the things that we've talked about this semester, VO2 max is very um, closely related to your genetics. Some people are born with higher VO2 max uh, abilities than others. So there's a very large genetic component. The units that we express VO2 max, we can either express it in liters per minute or mLs per kg per minute. And what we mean by this liters per minute is how many liters of oxygen is the individual using per minute. Okay. The problem with liters per minute is that it doesn't take body weight into consideration. So a larger person is going to consume more oxygen because a larger person has more cells using oxygen. And so if we just look at an individual's liters per minute without knowing what size that individual is, 
it doesn't tell us a whole lot about that person's fitness level. If we look at VO2 max and we divide it by the body weight in kilograms, now we have a better idea of how much oxygen that person is using for each kilogram of their body weight. So it's milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. And this is the usual um, units that we express it in. Those are the units that you saw on the graph because when we express VO2 max per kilogram body weight, it allows you to compare individuals with different body weights and to compare one individual who may have lost weight over time or gained weight over time. So VO2 in liters per minute is going to be highly affected by body weight. But if we divide the VO2 max by body weight, we eliminate the body weight factor, and now we have a better idea of the person's aerobic capacity or fitness level. Okay. What are some normal values? So if you take a normally active, untrained individual, 18 to 22 years old, Women tend to have an average of about 38 to 42. Men have an average of 44 to 50. So we do see a, um, differences between men and women. Um, the highest values for men are bigger than the highest values for women. And there are some reasons for that. Some of the advantages that men have is that uh, men have more fat-free mass than women. And the fat-free mass, that's, that's your muscle mass. Okay, Those are the cells that have mitochondria. Those are the cells that are using um, those are the cells that are using the oxygen. Okay, So if you've got more fat mass, you're going to be doing more work. You're going to be using more oxygen. Of course, you're going to consume more oxygen. Also, men, and we'll talk about this in another chapter, but men have more hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is what carries oxygen. So men have a greater ability to carry oxygen and therefore a greater ability to deliver oxygen and therefore a greater ability to use oxygen. Uh, the average man also tends to be more active than the average woman. So there is, um, on, on average, there is a fitness difference between men and women. Um, the other advantage that men have is that men have um, larger airways. So even if you take a man and a woman who are the same size, women tend to have smaller airways for their size. Uh, and that's a disadvantage because the airways are what's bringing air and oxygen into your lungs. So again, another advantage that men have in the ability to bring in oxygen deliver it, and then use it. Highest tested values. Uh, we've seen some crazy values. Um, it, for males, um, there are reported values in the high 90s. And for females, I've seen reported values in the high 70s. Okay, Many times these are cross-country skiers, cyclists, marathoners, um, endurance athletes, elite level endurance athletes. So when you train, you can increase your VO2 max. You can increase your aerobic capacity. And we've talked a little bit about some of the things that occur with training. And we're probably we're gonna spend the rest of this semester talking about all the different things that happen with endurance training and, and how and why we're able to deliver more oxygen and make more aerobic ATP. But for now, what I wanted to say is that your heredity not only determines your starting point of VO2 max, it also has a big effect on how you respond to training. So the average person who trains aerobically can increase their VO2 max 15 to 20 percent from from their starting value. But if we look at the whole population, 
we see a lot of variance. So we see low responders. No matter how hard they train, VO2 max doesn't change. And we also see high, high responders who can increase their VO2 max by as much as 50%. Okay? But most of us, this is what we're going to do with training, 15 to 20% increase. The way you respond to training also depends on your training status. If you're untrained to begin with, you have more room for improvement. So an untrained individual is going to have greater increase, more increases, more potential increases in VO2 max than somebody who's already well trained. We've already talked about the gender differences. Uh, men have a much greater potential for increasing their VO2 max. Uh, and again, I mentioned the advantages of fat, more fat-free mass, more hemoglobin, and larger passageways, air passageways. And the last thing I wanted to say is um, after aging, with aging, our VO2 max decreases. So after about 25 to 30 years of age, if you remain inactive, your VO2 max is going to decrease about 1% per year okay. if you are inactive. And that's key. You're never going to completely stop the decrease in VO2 max that occurs with aging, but you can significantly reduce it if you remain active. So that's the good news. Uh, a little bit about detraining also. Um, some interesting numbers. You don't need to know these, but they're kind of interesting. I got these from uh, a different source. But with detraining, okay, so if you stop, if you're doing your aerobic training, you've got some increases, you're doing great, and you stop, research shows that you can decrease your VO2 max about 8% within 12 days. So you lose these adaptations very fast. And researchers have shown a decrease of about 20% in about three months. So with aerobic training, more so than resistance training, detraining happens very quickly. Uh, we'll talk about uh, resistance training in um, the resistance chapter, but... Um, basically, we get um, the detraining rate from resistance training is much slower than this. So you can see two weeks off, and you can lose 8% of your VO2 max. Pretty significant. 